Okay. Uh, I guess we're not going to have time for a play. Nikita is coming. He's coming. He's on his way. Okay. No break. <laughs> okay, so our next speaker is again a uh, someone who has talked many times. Three, at least three times at the winter school. Always a pleasure. Zohar Komogorsky. And uh, his advisor is talking. <laughs> advisor, <laughs> it's your student's turn to speak. So Zora is going to give us some lectures about modern developments in quantum field theory, in particular today, line defects in quantum yes. field theory. Thank you so much. Uh, nice to see everybody. Um, let me just give you an overview of what this is going to be about, because maybe the title was not very illuminating. First, I'll give a broad overview of why uh, conformal theories are useful in condensed matter and in <coughs> high energy physics, of where conformal theories arise in various applications. Then I'll review a little bit, you know, for just the general philosophy behind perhaps four decades of work on understanding local operators and correlation functions in conformal theories. Then I'll talk about um, more general probes, which are extended operators, but uh, I'll just focus on nine operators because of two reasons. One is it's the simplest kind of extended operator, and secondly, those are uh, there is a lot of experimental data on line operators from condensed matter physics uh, for a reason that I'll explain when we get to that subject. You'll see that this is something that arises very naturally, and I'll talk about conformal line defects as opposed to gen general line defects. Then I'll talk about some, you know, the mathematical foundations of what it means to have a line operator in quantum field theory. For local operators, these foundations have been developed in the 60s in this uh, tour de force of axiomatic quantum field theory. I'm not going to do anything of that sort, and we also don't have the full set of foundations. I'll just talk about a little bit about some easy consistency conditions and some things we know are true. Then I'll discuss a little bit of terminology of what it means for a line operator to be screened. It might be different from what you're used to seeing in some literature in high energy physics, where line operators are used mostly for problems of confinement or deconfinement. But that's not the story here. Here I'm going to focus about conformal theories. So the notion of screening is different. And that's the notion that's used in condensed matter. So I'll, I'll introduce this notion. I'll introduce a slightly weaker well, a slightly more interesting <coughs> class of line operators which are not screened but not completely non-trivial. And then there is the subject of RG flows and line operators, uh, where I'll talk about entanglement entropy, <coughs> I'll talk about general facts about RG flows and uh, some, something that's called the G theorem or the quantum dimension theorem that uh, was developed over the last year, yeah. over this year, over 2022 basically at uh, the end of 2021. So this is quite recent, and the rest is more foundational. And once I finish that, uh, the second part of my talks will be about applications. So line operators, if you learn from a high energy physics perspective, you might know about Wilson lines, hoof lines. But I'll just show you that there is a huge class of interesting line operators, even in simple scalar field theories that appear in condensed matter in various applications. And we'll discuss what's known about them, how we can try to solve them. And we'll see that there is very nice contact with other fields of science. OK, so this is the plan. Uh, obviously, if there are any questions about anything I'm saying, just uh, raise your hand or just interrupt me. doesn't matter. OK, so let me just give you the history historical development of this subject about conformal theories and local operators. So uh, in the context of high energy physics, quantum field theory is believed to be important because we believe space-time is a continuous medium with Lorentz invariants. 
and quantum filter is like the only mathematically consistent framework that unifies relativity with <coughs> quantum mechanics. So conformal filter is a special case of quantum filter where there is no mass gap. So there are massless excitations. And that's roughly speaking why in high energy physics we're interested in that subject. It's just the you know, mathematical underpinning of uh, anything with a continuous space-time uh, obeying special relativity and quantum mechanics and where there is no gap. So there are massless particles. In condensed matter, this subject is also very interesting because it arises in the following way. So I'm just going to draw pictures <coughs> always in 2 plus 1 dimensions because it's uh, much easier to draw. So most, uh, so in condensed matter, there is no light cone in toy models of condensed matter because these are some systems that find it density usually or something of that sort. So a uh, class of models that condensed matter people are interested in are formulated with using a Hamiltonian rather than an action. So for instance, a thing they could consider is just a bunch of a, a it's a lattice model. Maybe it's an approximation to some magnet. Uh, it's a lattice model where at each lattice site <coughs> there is a Hilbert space there is a Hilbert space uh, which is two-dimensional. <coughs> there is a Hilbert space which is two-dimensional at each lattice site. And so at each lattice site, there are operators acting on this two-dimensional Hilbert space. Those are the Pauli matrices, so S high. So the vector index uh, stands for a x y and z and i stands for the lattice site okay and then people in condensed matter are interested in, interested in hamiltonians like this where j is some coupling constant uh, and then there would be a term where s would be uh, dotted into an s of a neighboring lattice site uh, it could be a neighboring lattice site horizontally or vertically you could even imagine one coupling J for vertical couplings, another coupling J for horizontal couplings. So SI, SI plus 1. Uh, where I have to be careful about the summation here by I plus 1. I'll, let me just do it like that. I plus uh, 0, 1. And here I'll do I plus 1, 0, hoping that you, may, you know, understand what I mean more or less. <laughs> just uh, one lattice site to the right or left. And so this is an interesting model, which has a phase <laughs> diagram. And you could add also, you could add many more terms. It's up to you, basically. Uh, in condensed matter, you, you can just add whatever you want. The rules of the game are extremely unrestricted. So you can add uh, more terms. You can ask, what are the phases of this model? Now, what do we mean by phases in a quantum anybody system? So we have to take a limit where the number of lattice sites is very large. And we have to ask what is the ground state and wave function, for instance. Okay? So you can try to find the ground state wave function. Which sounds extremely difficult, but you can try to ask in principle whether the ground state wave function undergoes some sort of phase transition. So what does a phase transition mean in practice? So you find the ground state wave function then you can compute correlators. So in the ground, in, so let's call this ground state the vacuum. So you can compute correlators in the vacuum. So you could take a spin operator at location n, a spin operator at location zero. Let's say this is n. This is some arbitrary uh, location which I call zero, and you can ask how does it behave as a function of the distance n. Now, for generic values of these couplings, j, uh, j vertical and j horizontal, the common sense is that this decays exponentially with some parameter uh, c, which is measured in, the, in, in units of the number of lattice sites. So it could be five lattice sites, it could be seven lattice sites. Uh, sorry, it should be in the denominator. It's, a, it's something that's measured in units of the lattice site, could be five, seven, ten lattice sites. And it's, of course, a, f a function of the couplings j uh, vertical and j horizontal. Okay? 
And you can also consider correlation functions of much more complicated uh, composite, composites made out of the spin operators. And so how does CFT arise in this business? There is no light cone, there is no relativistic invariance. So the, sur the, the point is that for some special loci of the space of cu coupling constants, this parameter goes to infinity. So at some special points, let's say this is the plane of J and the other J, there could be some line where C goes to infinity. And we say the correlation lens goes to infinity. That's the terminology. This, 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 this signifies a uh, second order uh, phase transition. It could be third order, it could be higher, but at least second order phase transition. That's the definition of a second order zero temperature phase transition. Why zero temperature? Because it's just the property of the ground state. Second order uh, zero temperature phase transition. In condensed matter, they use the abbreviation QPT, quantum phase transition because it's driven by quantum effects, not by terrible fluctuations. Okay, so at such points, the correlation lens becomes very large, and uh, the most deep observation about this situation is due to Wilson, for which he got the Nobel Prize. He said that since correlations become significant across many, many lattice sites, Wilson made this huge leap to say that therefore we can use a continuum description Okay. In this continuum description, it's not necessary that there is Lorentz invariance. It could be a Lifshitz field theory. It could be some non-relativistic continuous field theory. But in many, many examples in condensed matter, there is also accidental <coughs> Lorentz invariance in the continuum. So Lorentz invariance arises accidentally. So this is so Wilson basically said that when C goes to infinity, we use the continuum. And this is a very deep idea that was not proven. This is the foundations of QFT, that we can, we can forget about the lattice. It's in some sense analogous to mathematics, like there are problems in number theory and combinatorics, <coughs> and they're kind of completely unrestricted, right? You can imagine any problem you want of counting stuff in combinatorics, but in, con in, in, in calculus there are fewer problems, because less things make sense in calculus, or maybe calculus is more constrained. Sometimes, more problem, sometimes problems in number theory or combinatorics can be solved using calculus. This is when there is not much variation, maybe, or it's not too sensitive to exact which integer you choose, or some, something of that sort. So in some sense, QFT is, the, is, is calculus for physics. So this kind of model is like very discrete, it's very random, and it's completely unrestricted. You can add whatever you want. But the continuum description is much more tight, much more robust. So we have a continuum limit. It was never proven. But we believe that's true. And this continuum limit is quantum field, is conformal field theory. Because when C is infinite, strictly speaking, we get a conformal field theory. You can go slightly away from strictly C equals infinity. So if you are here, not exactly on the line, but a little bit below or above the line, then you could use quantum field theory, which is not yet exactly conformal, but there would be still some, something in the continuum to be said. Uh, but I'll just be exactly on the second order phase transition in these lectures to simplify so that we really have a conformal field theory with a light cone and SO D plus 1 comma 1 symmetry where space time uh, in my notation space time is uh, D minus 1 is D dimensional D minus 1 space 1 time so this is the symmetry group of conformal field theory it's bigger than just the light cone symmetry which is SO D minus 1 comma 1 Sorry, what did I do? Ah, sorry, I messed it up. Let me. Uh, I, I, I messed it up. Just give me a second. This is D. This is two. Okay. So the symmetry of just a Q of T. If you're slightly away from the line of phase transition, the symmetry of the Q of T would be this. If you're exactly on the line, it's enhanced to this. Why? Nobody knows. But that's what Wilson said, and we believe, and it's been verified experimentally. This claim means that for, uh, in this specific point there is some CFT that will give the same answers and as the lattice model. As the lattice model. Add to and small corrections. And saying that this is unproven means that there is no uh, concrete recipe of getting from here to there. 
Well, you have to prove that the infinite volume limit exists. Mm -hmm. So there are proofs for very special. Yeah, things. there are some people like Michael Eisenman dedicated their career to proving it in special cases, yeah. like phi to the four. And I, I never know exactly what's the status for phi to the four. I know it was proven probably in 2D and 3D. I don't know if what's. Yeah, I mean, in well, it's maybe also 4D by now. I don't know. So for some special lattice models, people have shown that there is a large volume limit and it goes to a continuum QFP and the axioms that you read in Feskin and Schroeder apply. Yeah. Now, I don't know, but of course in the realm of you know these interesting condensed matter systems, it's not just five to the four. There are millions, zillions of other things. And it's just a general belief, I would say. Hmm? Ising is five to the four. So I probably I think was proven. Yeah. So you can describe quantum field theory or probably as a very beautiful spin system, but you can take for instance also chains of harmonic oscillators and in the tunnel limit of uh, the large L and small distance, it will become a scale of field theory. So it's not necessarily the spin systems on the lattice that uh, you are putting this. You can also, yeah, what Kobe is saying is that uh, Kobe has another construction for a QFT where the Hilbert space at each lattice point is infinite dimensional. Uh, this is much less studied in the context of condensed matter. It's considered to be less under control because the Hilbert space is infinite dimension, even infinite dimensional, even at finite volume. So it's harder to set up numerical algorithms or to make rigorous statements. But yes, uh, that's another way to presumably arrive at QFT. Yes. Is there a simple intuitive argument why Lorentz would? Lorentz arises sometimes, not always. Mm -hmm. What you get in many cases is what's called Lifshitz field theory. Uh, sometimes you get what's called the dynamical exponent, which is equal to one, and you get an emergent flight cone. And, uh, there is no fundamental explanation I'm aware of, of when this happens. I don't know. <coughs> but it's very, very generic. Also from experience with, uh, let's say, phase transitions, people haven't found many terribly interesting phase transitions with non-zero dynamical exponents, with, non with dynamical exponents not equal to one just very few, so it's maybe more generic to just land on z equals 1, but there are just very few other options, maybe. Like, you don't know of a million Lifshitz conformal theories that are genuinely interesting. Very few are known. Maybe it's an under the lamppost effect, but we don't, I, I don't, we don't know. Any other questions? All right, so what, is this, what does this group consist of? It consists of dilations. So dilations are a symmetry in the continuum where you scale space and time with the same exponent, with the same <coughs> coefficient lambda. So we believe that this is just a consequence of the divergent correlation lens. That doesn't matter on which scale you look, you see the same physics, so to speak. Then there are translations and rotations. By that I mean also boosts. <coughs> translations plus rotations and boosts. And then there is special conformal transformations. Uh, those are, I mean, those are the most mysterious ones. They arise at fixed, it seems that they always arise when there is this uh, diverging correlation lens. We also have special conformal transformations. They also arise generically in Schrodinger systems, which are with, with a different dynamical exponent. So this seems uh, quite generic. They are perhaps the most surprising symmetry. Th this is less surprising, it's kind of built in. Okay. So that's how conformal filters arise in condensed matter physics. And now I'll tell you a little bit what have people have been doing in the last uh, four decades, very roughly, about this problem. Any, so there was a question. So very roughly, uh, in the continuum language, we have local operators, <coughs> which are functions of space-time. On the other hand, in the lattice system, there are basically products of spin operators at various lattice sites and so on. You can make an arbitrary com composite operator made out of spins and there is a map between local operators on the lattice and, some con and continuum operators. And dilations uh, provide the continuum operators with a good notion of scaling dimension. That's the eigenvalue of a local operator under this dilation. So if O goes to lambda to the power minus delta times O, 
we say that O has scaling dimension delta. And this scaling dimension is very important. It constrains the correlation functions of such local operators. Let me just remind you that OI, OI at two distinct points uh, is determined completely up to normalization by this, by this uh, uh, delta parameter. So, yes? Uh, this i here is not related to the site location i. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Th this i just labels local operators. Okay, yeah. And it corresponds to all the possible products of spins. So this i becomes the space-time coordinate, roughly speaking. You see what I mean? Yeah. I just, I, I would yeah. probably not be useful to introduce different notation now because I won't be able to stick to it. So just let's hope there is no confusion. You can see from this picture that there are probably tons of local operators. And indeed, we know that every consistent conformal filter has infinitely many local operators. And they, there is an exponential, an exponentially many of them in some sense. I, I won't go into that. But there are tons and tons of local operators. And each one has a different scaling exponent delta i. And there, well, there are two point functions that are determined, as I said, like this. If you read classical books about the subject, the delta i's have Greek names. Alpha, beta, gamma, delta, eta, nu. Did they, they were called hyperscaling exponents or something like that in the 60s. But now we know that there are infinitely many deltas, and those seven letters just corresponded to the smallest possible deltas, numerically the smallest possible numbers, because they are the easiest to measure in experiment. And why are they the easiest to measure in experiment? Because correlation functions decay with some power of delta. So the smaller delta is, the slower would the correlation function decay. So w it would be easier to measure. Measuring very large deltas is intrinsically difficult because you have to either come up with a very carefully concocted product of operators to have just one delta in the answer, or you have to make a very precise measurement because it's going to be numerically small. But it's crucial in the game that is, of course, that there are only a finite number of operators. Yes. And we believe, yes, it's, it's of course, <coughs> it's of course. So wh what David said is that, yes, there are infinitely many local operators, but we believe that below every uh, arbitrary number delta naught, there are finitely many. So we believe that while there are infinitely many in total, there are finitely many below delta naught, but how many are there below some given delta naught? It's a huge number. Uh, it goes like exponential of delta naught to the power d over d minus 1, if I'm not mistaken. I might have a factor of 2 off. But it's something like an exponential of the, that's the number of operators below delta naught. It's an exponential of delta naught to some power. I might not have the power exactly right now. Well, you cannot understand this from the lattice as far as I know. But you can understand it from thermodynamics. If you want uh, the system to equilibrate, you need many local operators. So there is such a count. Yeah. Uh, I just want it's not d minus one over d. Yeah, I probably <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah, because it has to be a square root in two That's dimensions. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. D minus one over d. So it still grows exponentially with delta naught, and uh, so there are tons of them, but finitely many be below delta naught. Okay. So. That's hmm? In principle, yes. When you make a con when you concoct a complicated product of spin operators, it would not map to a single operator with con with a concrete eigenvalue under dilations. It would map to a linear combination, and that's why when people made measurements in the past, they only saw the smallest deltas always, because there was always a contribution from some low delta operators. You have to kind of co 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 find very mysterious linear combinations of operators on the lattice to zoom in on some high dimension operator. <coughs> and actually, if you talk to people that work in this field in critical phenomena, I was shocked. I won't say names, but even big experts in that field don't, didn't, don't know that there are more than seven deltas. <laughs> they think that there are like you know, seven critical exponents. And that's it. So yeah, we now know better than that, so anyway.
subject. I just wanted to tell you that there was tons of work on these delta i's. People like worked on this density and there are millions of things you can do. But I'm going to tell you why line operators, uh, how they appear in experiment and what do we know about them theoretically. Are there any questions about these motivations? What is the decision between these? Yes, no, just a second, yes. No. What is the decision between these three operators and the one that is It's not known in general. You have to measure it on the lattice. You have to try to combine, you know, make arbitrary linear combinations and try to find all the exponents and then construct the map. We don't have the exact map. Maybe in these models that Eisenman understood there is a better understanding of the map, but I don't know actually. I'll be surprised if there is anything known about it. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to go into that. Ask me after the lecture how to derive it, I'll explain. If you are, if you know the basics of CFT, I can tell you the keywords. You can do it in the tutorial. Yeah, I can do it in the tutorial, tutorial, or I can just do it some other time. Okay. Is it true that every local operator? Every local operator, which by definition diagonalizes, we choose a basis of local operator so that uh, this symmetry is diagonalized. So every operator has its own eigenvalue. So, so these are primary. <laughs> I didn't even want to use that terminal. These are any. I, these are just eigenvalues of the dil dilations. They don't have to be primaries. Right. They don't have to be primaries. <laughs> I didn't want to get get it to that. Yeah, yeah. Th there are yeah. Some la lattice models end up being a little bit more exotic than this uh, structure. They might have a dynamical exponent, or the dilations might not be diagonalizable, which is what Nikita mentioned. But uh, yeah, these are slightly more exotic scenarios. Hmm? Yeah, there, there are models where the dilations are not diagonalizable. It's uh, so. Uh, yes. In the continuum, there is rotation symmetry emerging and also a light cone. Yeah, I, I, I introduced these two couplings because uh, maybe I was afraid that there is some expert in the audience and it's known that if there is only one J, there is no phase transition. So I was afraid somebody will catch me. But yeah, once you introduce these two and some four body interactions, uh, there are a very nice review of Sandvik, Andrea Sandvik from Boston University about the phases of this model, about what's known about it currently. I didn't say that only the dimensions enter. I said in the two-point function, only the dimensions enter. Well, but that's what people are using also when they compute higher point functions. I, I haven't seen people using other casting of uh, the, 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 the Like, three-point functions depend on some new coefficients, and four-point functions depend on lots of new coefficients. The scaling dimension is just the eigenvalues under dilations. It's not everything that well, you that need to know. You can refer as one of the casting but uh, Yes. It's I don't understand why the other two are not showing up. In two point, well, Kobe, I was a little bit glib here. I this two point function formula is strictly speaking true only for primers, and I didn't really want to get into it. <coughs> so even for two point functions, you have to write a different formula for non primaries. There are a slightly different structure, and also I was only focusing on operators with no spin. There is uh, operators also have quantum numbers under rotation, so. It's just a heuristic. The other 
Spin, spin, yeah. Yeah, I'm just giving a heuristic explanation of what a, a question that kind of followed from Wilson's and Polyakov's ideas in the 70s. Uh, I'm going to go now to line operators. So, in condensed matter, one nice question is to find correlation functions between products of spins, right? You try to find correlation functions between these products of spins in the ground state wave function. But uh, oftentimes, in condensed matter, the system is considered not completely pure. So, uh, from now on, the correlation length will be just set to infinity throughout. I'll be exactly at the phase transition point. Just to simplify the discussion, and we can stay within the realm of uh, conformal field theory in the continuum. So in the condensed matter description, there could be a few lattice sites which are broken. Let's say four. It doesn't matter. As long as it's a finite number, it's going uh, to be the same. It's the same theory <coughs> with the plane. So there could be a few broken lattice sites. Broken, what do I mean? <coughs> First, they could have different coupling constants. You can imagine many options, actually. Different coupling constants. They could have an external magnetic field. So for instance, there could be a new term in the action in the Hamiltonian, I'm sorry, where you put an external magnetic field of those four lattice sites. Not a uniform magnetic field like we do in phase transitions, but a magnetic field that's only localized to a few lattice sites. Uh, you could imagine something even more interesting. You could deform the Hamiltonian by adding completely new degrees of freedom here. So completely new degrees of freedom with their own quantum <coughs> mechanical Hamiltonian, because now it's like, let's say, one, two, three, four lattice sites. So you can use just ordinary quantum mechanics to model it. So you have a new impurity Hamiltonian coupled to some operator uh, coupled to some operator from the previous Hamiltonian that's made out of our original spins. Yeah, and this should be better local, so you should use the spins nearby. You should use the spin degrees of freedom here to write such couplings. And this could be some, new, some quantum mechanical system. It could be just the quantum mechanics of a particle with two states, <coughs> or it could be any quantum mechanical model that you like. It could be a particle in a magnetic field, like Landau levels. Okay, so there could be some new degrees of freedom on that side. Uh, what other options you could imagine for putting, uh, destroying a few lattice sites? Another option that is very popular is when you put some impurity Hamiltonian, which has some global symmetry, some internal U1 symmetry, and you couple it to an emergent gauge field. Well, I, not in a, in a Hamiltonian language, I have to do it a little differently. I'll, 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 I'll describe it a little bit more clearly later. You can do something like gauging. In principle, uh, this, all these kind of things you can do on a few lattice sites, they are called impurities. Okay? And impurities are of all sorts and possibilities. There are all, all sorts of possibilities for what impurities uh, could arise in condensed matter. This probably is a very small subset. So one very popular thing to do is to say, let's say we have one lattice site, but instead of a spin a half Hilbert space, in this lattice site we'll put a spin s Hilbert space. Small, little, let's do lower cases, spin s Hilbert space. And then you could couple that big spin to the rest. You could imagine that these are like spin a half uh, electrons, and there is suddenly an atom with a huge spin. Or like the <coughs> th there, there will be a nucleus with a huge spin. And this nucleus would couple to the uh, spin a half degrees of freedom on the other lattice sites. And this is a very famous problem for historical reasons, where you replace one lattice site by a spin, <coughs> s, by a spin s degree of freedom. This is called condom. This uh, actually launched the whole field of uh, renormalization and quantum field theory, in my understanding. Uh, so uh, this, are this is just a subset of impurities we could introduce. Now, so basically, impurities is the same as garbage. So you, you have to, so the challenge here is to 
like we understand that in the that the lattice model turns into a conformal filter, what does this impurity turn into? It's localized in space, but it's extended in time because we've changed the Hamiltonian at every instant in time. So in a continue in this language of space time, it's a line operator, which is localized in space. Okay, so it's localized in space, but it's uh, extended in time. So line operators that are extended in time encode garbage in the continuum description. Yeah. But it's a line operator that's it's not an operator in the original theory. Well, uh, just one second, I'll get into that. Maybe I'm using the op word operator. It's extremely misleading. Uh, let me say line defect for now. But I'll, I'll tell you what I'm why I'm, I'm using the word operator as well. So line defects describe Line defects in the conformal field theory will describe all the possible ways of putting garbage in the continuum limit. And once you switch to that language of the continuum, you can do the magical weak rotation. So we know that uh, as soon as you go to the continuum, we have this magical way of exchanging space and time, which makes no sense in the original lattice model. But it makes sense at the second order phase transition. And then we can also say that the very same line operate line defect can also be viewed as a space-like operator, extended operator. But so it means that near second order phase transition, a piece of garbage that's localized on your lattice site, on one lattice site, should be somehow mathematically equivalent to a operator that's made out of spins that are living on some approximate line. But on, from the lattice point of view, you cannot construct this it's so it is uh? if, time, if time were discrete, that, that would make, make sense in a lot of lost. If it's sort of the continuous time you had clock. You need to evolution. No, but mm, what maybe what you're saying is that you could think about this as an operator by just doing discrete evolution, but then it would not uh, I, I yeah, don't know I what mean, to mean. You could talk about the previous life. Yeah. Here this is a Hamiltonian formulation, so there is no manifest symmetry between time and space. In quantum field theory, we're allowed to do this manipulation. Instead of the Hamiltonian, I, I had exponential into the minus h. Oh yeah, yeah. In statistical physics, it makes sense, but I, I I'm not. I don't want to get to that confusion. Yes. Why do you say that this can be written out of spins? The, the operator we had was not an operator. It's a spin s. It's a yeah, that's what I'm saying. So, so how, how you see, on the lattice, on the lattice, the lattice there are two objects which are completely distinct. One is just local operators made out of products of spins. Another is just take a few lattice sites and make some garbage there. Okay. Making some garbage is like a line <coughs> of line defect extended in time. The product of spins across a line is a line operator that is extended in space. But the fact that we have a light cone and the reconstruction axioms for, for weak rotations means that there is a correspondence. Well, it has to be an operator at fixed time. So what can it be made out of if not the product of spins? Any operator on the lattice is just the product of spins. Maybe I enlarge my theory. No, no, it's the same theory. That's exactly what weak rotation guarantees, that you can change what you call time, and you have the same theory. OK? But of course, in the lattice formulation, it's extremely uh, confusing. Like, what is the? extended line operator that mimics a condo defect. <coughs> <coughs> it's always uh, some bizarre thing. Yeah. yeah. So is it in, in this yeah, it is. I think it is, yes. Once you write in the continuum language what it is and you do the weak rotation, it right gives now. you a very good hint of what to look at. Which can be followed. Which can be then followed and probably it wasn't done in Monte Carlo, but probably it can be followed to show that it's the same near a second order transition. But it wasn't done. I, I'm saying it's not very difficult to guess, I believe, in examples like Kondo. Because Kondo has a very nice continuum description that I'll mention soon. Yeah. So, so in this side, you don't have actually any time direction, because uh, one, of, one of the direction you are considering it as, as time. Time is parallel to the blackboard. Okay. Uh, sorry, uh, transverse to the blackboard. Okay. This is just space. This is a lattice in space. I was but talking about two plus one. But then yeah. the equivalence of this uh, constant in time operator turning into space operator, you should have a 
an instant you have the line operator and then it is gone. Yes, exactly. Oh, so it's an operator on the Hilbert space. Okay. So this is an operator acting on the Hilbert <coughs> space, okay. and this is a change in the Hilbert <coughs> space. This theory has a new vacuum, a new Hilbert space, and completely different Hilbert space. The Hilbert space of this system with a spin s degree of freedom is not the same as even the original Hilbert space. It <coughs> contains an additional s degrees of freedom at that lattice size. Yet, the you should be able to remove it and mimic the mathematics, not the physics, but the mathematics by an extended operator in space, in space localized in time. It's not even the same Hilbert space. So that's the magic of weak rotation. It allows you to change the Hilbert space, but you should get the same answer. But you're saying that uh, although you're sure that this is there's no explicit. Nobody did it. Like I did not. It, it, they didn't construct this thing, as far as I know. Uh, for like condo. Yeah. yeah. As far as I know, I might not be fully updated, but. Yes, you were yeah. asking about the rewrite. Of I, I'm not saying it's a challenge that we should work on now. It was just a small comment. Yeah. No that no in <laughs> condense in con yeah, in, in, the in the literature, people say line defects and line operators, <laughs> and the reason that these two term these two. Uh, these two terms are interchanged is because weak rotation allows you to interchange the two interpretations. So if you like more a given Hilbert space and think about operators, like your quantum information theories, you might like this. For me, I like this much more when I think about the physics because I have to guess the new vacuum and I may have some intuition about what's the new vacuum. So it depends on your taste. You should be able to think in both terms, they're equivalent. So when I think about the Wilson line, it's a probe particle with some charge. It's easier for me to guess that it creates Coulomb field, and that's the new vacuum. Uh, this interpretation of the Wilson line would be like, what is going to be the operator acting on the Hilbert space that creates a thin electric field in some line? Uh, like I don't have much intuition about it. So it's harder for me to guess what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, do you have to make sure that the garbage you're adding doesn't uh, spoil the reflection positivity in this space now? Uh, yeah, I'm assuming that the Hamiltonian of the impurity is Hermitian, okay. and the discoupling is, is still Hermitian. <coughs> That's all you need. Okay. Then you're guaranteed that this is going to be still CPT invariant, and you can do weak rotations. Yes. I just need a Hermitian impurity. <coughs> Hermitian. So I already assumed that the model without the garbage was equivalent to a QFT with Lorentz symmetry and conformal symmetry, in fact. I just assumed that from the get-go. This, this edge in, uh, involves enlarging the Hilbert space? I yeah. understand that always from... The always from the bulk. Yeah. It's a product of spins. H imp could involve a completely new Hilbert space living at that point. So when we get to Wilson lines, we'll see that's what happens in Wilson lines. You add the full Hilbert space of some colored particle, charge part, colored probe particle. Okay. Or in condo, you add the Hilbert space of a spin S nucleus. Yeah. So, just sorry, last question. Uh, when you do the rotation now, the, you're not guaranteed that the degrees of freedom in the weak rotated uh, system are the same as the unrotated right. system, right? It's just the magic of weak rotation. It can, you can change the Hilbert space, but the answer should be the same. Yeah, okay, but you don't know that now it should be written in terms of spins. I do know, because in this interpretation, my Hilbert space is the theory of the spins. It's just an extended operator in the theory of spins. Right? I do know yeah. that it should be possible to write it with just the you know usual. It's just extended along one line. Yes, it's extended along one line. What if, if you, you saw a rotation that is along some diagonal line? Yeah, then it would Irrational it would mean it would mean that it's that the physics is the same as the garbage piece that's moving. A moving garbage piece. You can take a piece of garbage like a nucleus and just decide that somebody put an engine on this nucleus and it's just moving through the lattice. Yeah. So your H so this could be time dependent. This this could be time dependent. You could say that I wanna understand the quantum system with a piece of garbage that's just moving at constant velocity. Nobody can stop you from doing that. But I guess the question could be that can you decompose this uh, you know, with a, a diagonal line, line defect into a, a line operator and uh, an impurity which is suspended? No, no, you cannot do that. If you quantize in the direction that David said, 
it will, yeah. String theory, we have our bound state. So the D string, with the fundamental string, can bind mm -hmm. and become one one string. So each in some picture will be in a string junction. And that might, might oh. duality become one of the end. So in fact, it's proof. Well, um, David, uh, so let me just explain to the students. The question was, what about line operators that look like this, that are neither in time nor in space? They're well, condensed. My, my question was about line operators which were on some irrational, irrational? So they don't ah, trust okay. any lattice site. OK, yeah, then, then they might, I mean, that they don't, allow with, don't align with the lattice. Yeah. But there is emergent SO2 symmetry, so you can always align them. There is emergent rotational symmetry. You can always align them. Like the, f the condensed matter meaning of a line <coughs> operator that's diagonal is just a moving piece of garbage. Another thing that they often consider, actually, is a line operator that looks like this, where this is the time direction. This corresponds to a piece of garbage that was static, and then it suddenly somebody started moving it. And then it emits some radiation. So this is a, prob a problem that uh, you can also consider. So it's like an uh, radiation due to acceleration. Hmm? <coughs> There's no, it's zero temperature. This whole question is just about finding the vacuum with okay. in the presence of the line operator. But uh, I'm just doing zero temperature, and then this impurity Hamiltonian is fixed by you. It's not dynamical. You fix what is the impurity. It's not going to move if you don't tell it to move. It only is going to fluctuate in the, de in the degrees of freedom inside the impurity Hamiltonian. It's not going to fluctuate of where it is if you don't allow it to do that. Yeah. Usually in condensed matter, we like it to be finite because they just to like the, uh, to. Pr system. Hmm? Compared to the original system. No, you could take infinite s. It's a very famous uh, challenge to try to understand the infinite s limit. It's some um, very nice semi classical limit, actually. I want to talk about it in principle if I get to it. Any other questions? <laughs> okay, so this is why line defects are interesting. And now I want to. Uh, so in the bulk, uh, when I say the bulk, it's not ADS-CFT. For me, this is the bulk, and this is the impurity. <laughs> okay. So in the bulk, we've tuned to a second-order phase transition. The line defect is just some random Hamiltonian that somebody decided to add. It's not going to be conformal from the get. It's not going to be conformal. So the pertinent question that we have to ask now is given a line operator, I'll take it to be extended in time, because this is the uh, most physically appealing, maybe for me, uh, construction. What are the symmetries that you can preserve? Of course, once you have a defect in space, time, you're not going to be able to preserve complete translations, rotations. So you're going to preserve a subgroup. And you can try to preserve as many as possible. And if you do preserve as many as possible, we say that this impurity is conformal. So very much like in the bulk, in the bulk there were couplings like J vertical, J horizontal, we have to tune them. Similarly, inside the impurity Hamiltonian, there will be lots of new Js, lots of new couplings, and there, those there could be some also couplings here between the bulk operator and the impurity Hamiltonian. We also have to tune them to get to a conformal line operator. Is that clear? So even though the bulk is conformal, it doesn't mean that the impurity is conformal. The impurity would be conformal in the infrared. Or it could be conformal because you've tuned the couplings to be conformal. So let's discuss. The, this is the notion of the conformal line defect. So in conformal field theory, not every line operator is conformal. You have to tune something or flow to the infrared. I'll give many examples, but now I just want to develop the theory. So, so what are the symmetries that you can preserve if you have a, an extended in time line operator? You can preserve dilations. Everybody agrees? It preserves the location of the line. Can you suggest more symmetries? Rotations around the line. Rotations around the line. Which group does this furnish? So, so no. Well, let's do d, d, d minus 1. Yeah. Ah. 
Uh, what else? Time translations. time translations, energy conservation. So I'm assuming the Hamiltonian of the impurity is time independent. Time translations. And last one. Uh, one special conformal transformation. So let me show you why. So a general, a general special conformal transformation is given by this formula. This is a general conformal transformation labeled by a parameter b in space time. If you choose the one for which only b naught or bt is non-zero, but all the other components vanish, and you uh, uh, plug it in here, you would see that x prime i, this goes away. x prime i is proportional to x i. So that means that if your line operator was at x i equals to 0, so that's where the garbage is, it's going to stay the same after the special conformal transformation. And that means <coughs> that this one is preserved. How does it act on the line defect? You, can, you have to compute t prime from this formula. And after a small computation, you will find a t over 1 plus lambda t or something like that. Let me just check what it's going to be. You're going to find t over 1 minus lambda t. And that's at x i equals to 0. That's how it acts on the line itself. So together, this, <coughs> so, so let's just write it like this. t prime equals t over 1 minus lambda t. Lambda is any number. Oh, sorry, yes, it's b0. It's b0. <coughs> bt. Bt. OK? So what does this group, uh, wh what is this group? How about boost and uh, Boost? Well, for boost, you have to choose a direction to boost in. Which direction do you want to boost in? You cannot boost in time. Yeah, you have to choose a space-like direction to boost in. That's not going to work. So, so this, this, and this together give SL2R. And this gives SL2. Uh, sorry, SLD minus 1. <laughs> SLD minus 1. OK, so this is what I'm going to call in this lecture as a conformal line operator. It's not the most general thing. You can imagine that some impurities break rotational symmetry. You can imagine that the impurity carries some internal spin. Uh, I, people constructed such in the literature. I'm not going to use it in this very much, but just bear this issue in mind. I'll just put it in parentheses. It's not strictly necessary for an impurity to be conformal that it has rotation, transverse rotations. OK, so these are the symmetries of a conformal line defect. If you start from a general line defects where the coupling constants were not tuned, it will not obey SL2R. You have to flow to the infrared, which in a sense I'll explain. You have to just go to long distances from the impurity, replace it by an effective impurity, and eventually it will be conformal. So basically, you, any impurity is believed to flow eventually to a conformal impurity. By flow, you have to do something like an energy flow on the line defect. I'll discuss what it means later. So just qualitatively, that's what you should expect. Yeah. You could also add different line, different uh, 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 constructions of defects to preserve the symmetry, right? If you, if let's say you put some uh, the lattice of defects, now you partially preserve yeah. the relation. Yeah, you could do lattices of defects. I'm not going to discuss it here. I'm just discussing one, okay. one line operator. You can do a network of lines. and. Yeah. But I don't, I don't want to discuss it. Yes? Are the symmetries that are broken explicitly or spontaneously? The other ones? Like, I mean, you can wait the defect and have problems. OK. So it's an excellent question. Are the other symmetries broken explicitly or spontaneously? So let's say translational symmetry. Let's talk about, you'll see that we have to discuss this question. But let's just talk about translational symmetries, uh, transverse to the line. Uh, 
in this system you don't really expect momentum to be conserved obviously because there is an impurity you can scatter off the impurity so you should really think about it as being explicitly broken there are no phonons for the following reason a phonon would be the situation that this line is allowed to fluctuate but this line is not allowed to fluctuate it's a piece of garbage that we hold in place if this piece of garbage was made dynamical it would be kind of spontaneous breaking but it's not made dynamically. It's located at a specific point, so it cannot vibrate and cannot emit phonons. So you should really think about it as explicitly broken. But it could be that if mean, you have a screen, yeah, you know, it's it's just <laughs> <laughs> overload on my uh, small brain. Yes. I think the, the picture on the other hand, where it's extended in the spatial direction, it does break uh, and has a no. Then it's a local. It's an operator. When we say it something breaks or it doesn't break a symmetry, it's a property of the vacuum. It's yeah. not a property of a local operator. Okay. Uh, sorry, of an operator. So the question here, I interpreted the question what was whether the vacuum in the presence of this defect has a uh, gapless modes from translational symmetry. And the answer is no. There is just no con momentum that's conserved. No conserved momentum here. Yeah. So w when you consider the string theory, a long string, then yeah, but this long string is not an external defect. It's an excitation of the system. Right. So it's not an it's not an external defect. Yeah. Just to make you with a simple example, I mean, like in one plus one dimension, for instance, the simplest example for that would be to turn the only boundary conditions to uh, open boundary conditions. Uh, you mean a, a, you want a lattice example or a QFT no, example? A filter example, so I'll uh, I meet once a filter example. I'll give, <coughs> I'll give you one, just that you have something to think about before I tell you what is the answer to that example. The simplest example. Simplest example. Uh, Ising 2D is okay? Okay. Uh, you start from the Ising 2D. <coughs> it's 1 plus 1D. Yeah. So there is a special local operator called Sigma, which has dimension 16, 1 over 16, comma 1 over 16. It's fine? Yeah? You integrate it you add to the action of the Ising model an integral of sigma of t times dt uh, at, x, at x equals to zero. So if you want, I'll write, I'll write it as dx dt times a delta function in x. You integrate sigma on across. Huh? Is this good example or no? Yes, but it's not the same. It is the simplest. It's the Ising 2D. <laughs> it's 2D Ising. Suppose I take a scalar field. He wants the example for the free boson. Yes, the free boson. Oh, this is a free fermion. So for the free boson, it will be. Free boson, I can write an exponential of x. <laughs> yeah, I can write. You can do an exponential of x. No, but this is a very interesting example. It, sure, sure. it corresponds to turning on external magnetic field at one point in the Ising chain. Um, so it's a term in the action. If you want to think, I wrote it as a term in the action, modeling a piece of garbage. You can also write it as a line operator in the language of high energy physics. It's a pass order, the exponential of the integral of sigma dt. If you ever saw the formulas of you know, David's formulas for this BPS Wilson lines, they have a scalar piece. This is like the scalar, just the scalar, no gauge field. It's just a pass order, the exponential of the scalar of the Ising model times dt. I mean, what's, what's uh, the interface? This is an interface. Well this has two sides. You, you wrote as an operator. Like no, this is the line operator. Boundary conditions. This is the line operator, literally. It's a line operator. You see, it's an integral over time at a given point in space. But what I had in mind is, I took a string to one It's also strings in the title of So, but closed string versus open string. Close ring, I have SO2 generated by F0 at yes, minus yes, yes. 1. And the yeah, you can think about the boundary condition. If I put open boundary conditions, it's going yeah. to the diagonal. Yes, yes. Is that an example for No, the I'm not talking about... Uh, so you're, what you're talking about is a quantum system with some degrees of freedom, and then a quantum system with some other degrees of freedom. I see. So it's an I what you're talking about is an interface between two different theories. I'm talking about line operators in I a given theory. The uh, just I, you could also talk about this. I just don't want to overcomplicate the discussion. No, I want to keep it in some. Okay, but if you want to ask yourself, what is the simplest 
line operator you can imagine. It's, this is the answer. It's the scalar, the scalar integral of the Ising model. Okay. And we actually know everything about the infrared limit of this. So I have just a question. <coughs> in, in, qu in quantum field theory in general, one evolved from saying that uh, fields either flow in the infrared to a to a conformal theory or to a topological theory? Yes. Is there also the possibility to go to a topological impurity? Yeah, so when this is exactly the next topic. What I'm, I'm now go discussing conformal impurities in general. Sometimes the conformal impurity would be trivial conformal impurity. That's the next, this is this subject. So I'm going to give you the exact definition so of what it means. trivial will be topological. When you say non-trivial... So there are three options for the infrared. Non-trivial conformal. Topological or screen slash trivial. But I'll define what it means carefully. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, uh, just a second. Where was I? Oh, so we have this. Uh, so the infrared is some conformal impurity with these symmetries, SL2R times SLD minus 1. In this example, if you've understood this example, it's not conformal from the get go. There is an RG <coughs> flow. The G flows to some fixed point G and then the line becomes conformal. So you can also tune this G to some G star, and then it will be exactly conformal from the get-go. But if you don't tune, it's just going to flow to a conformal fixed point. There will be a beta function for G, so to speak. But now I, I, I want to discuss our G flows later. First, I want to discuss the symmetries of a conformal impurity, and what are the consistency conditions. These two subgroups, they don't come in These two subgroups? They do, why not? Uh, they do. Dilatation with rotations. Dilation commutes with rotations. Okay, okay. Yeah. Doesn't yeah. commute with spatial translation. Right, right. right. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? tell you a little bit about the axioms of these conformal impurities. So now I'm discussing this topic, the consistency equations. So in this picture, where it's extended in time, a very natural idea is that we have bulk operators, which I denote O, I, X, T. But you should also bear in mind that there could be local degrees of freedom on the line, like in the Kondo problem or the Wilson line. There could be some intrinsic local degrees of freedom on the line, on the defect itself, on the impurity, because you've just introduced uh, an impurity Hilbert space. So there are some operators O hat, but they are just functions of time. And they're also labeled by some index that I'll call I, just sloppily. It's not the same index. There is no connection a priori. I'm just capital. <coughs> There is a priori no relation whatsoever between these operators and these operators. It's not the same set. It's not the same density. I told you that the density of those operators is e to the delta d minus 1 over d. I, I don't know that this is the same for these ones. I don't know if this is true. Yeah, I, I actually, it no, it should be true. The, the prefactor would be different, I think. No, th this should be true. The, the density should be the same, but the prefactor should be different. But in principle, I don't know of any relationship between these two sets of operators. But they still talk to each other. There's so the main consistency condition is that they kind of talk to each other. And this talking to each other is called the boundary, the bulk defect OP. That's the main idea. So you know about the idea that if you take a product of two local operators in the bulk, you can expand them in local operators. The bulk defect OP is the, is the idea that OI of X and T can be Taylor expanded in defect operators when it's very close to the defect. So the idea is that hitting the bulk with a local operator is somehow equivalent to hitting the defect with defect operators when they're near sufficiently close by. So you do a Taylor expansion like O, I had T at the same time, but then you have to put scaling dimensions corresponding to the bulk operators 
minus the scaling dimensions of defect operators, which I put a head on. The scaling dimensions of the bulk operators are delta, and the scaling dimensions of defect operators are delta hat. They have nothing to do with each other. It's a, a new set of scaling dimensions. So, but you should still imagine that there is an expansion <coughs> like this with some unknown coefficients, ai, that depend on little i, of course. Okay, so this is the main axiom. This is the main idea that you can expand bulk operators in terms of different operators, and it should be convergent. On the OP analogy, I should expect it should be OI times an operator on the line defect that you can expand. Can you say again? I mean, I would expect with the analogy of the OP that the uh, product of an operator should also the different time operator on the different would be such a sum. That's also true. If you take a product of uh, this and this, you can use this expansion take the product of this expansion with a defect operator and rewrite it as a sum of defect operators. Like stronger, uh, like stronger this is stronger because this implies what you said. Yeah. yeah. So this, this axiom is uh, the main axiom. <coughs> it allows you to expand bulk, bulk operators in terms of defect operators. And the most interesting thing that people actually measure uh, when they discuss this kind of set setup with an impurity or a piece of garbage is the unit operator here. So there is a special coefficient corresponding to the unit operator, where the power is just x to the delta i plus other terms. And this coefficient is what people have most data about, just speaking practically. This was measured in many defects, including in this one that I gave you here. So this coefficient. So, uh, question. so, so you, you can describe these uh, defects by adding to the action a uh, one dimensional action, right? The uh, Something. Now that, that something has to be necessarily conformal? No, I'm assuming it's conformal now. Right, but in principle you can... In principle, we'll there is an RG flow on the line defect. Mm -hmm. Here there is also an RG flow on the line defect. It's not going to be conformal out of the box. You have to tune the couplings like you do in the bulk. Okay. So this first coefficient is the most important experimentally because this first coefficient tells you the one point function in the bulk. <coughs> you can read out the one point function immediately. So the, cor the one point function of a local bulk operator distance x away, distance x away from the defect is this coefficient divided by the distance to some power. And that's what people measure. So of course the defect doesn't make a huge influence very far away from itself, but the influence decays algebraically. And that's what you've got to measure. This is one piece of data. Are there any questions about this one point function? Not different theories, different sets of operators. These are operators that act on the Hilbert space, but they're not the same set. Both of them act on the Hilbert space, but there is not the same set of operators. Okay? So these one point functions are important. I want to tell you two things. Two more things about the conformal defect case. So this also and then we'll go to this. Yeah. Sorry, this also like implies that like around the defect, does this imply that like there's basically the, the entire degrees of freedom just come from the defect and nothing else? Like this looks like it determines the uh, OP of two. This the but when you say this operator. you mean this or this? Um that, yes, the uh, the, the this axiom, yes. What about it? Um it looks like the uh, I mean cl close to the defect. The only thing that matters is the defect operators and nothing else. You can expand bulk operators in terms of defect operators. That's all I can say. But this provides a very strong consistency check. A consistency condition on any... I'm, I'm talking now talking a little bit in the language of the bootstrap. Yeah. So suppose you have a Green's function in the bulk. This is the defect. And you have a Green's function in the bulk between two points. So this provides two ways of computing this Green's function. I don't want to go into it, but one is to OPE them in the bulk first, and then use the bulk defect OPE, and then read out the coefficient AI, yes. because that's the only thing that's going to survive in that channel. Or first you can do, uh, you can first expand each of them in defect operators, and then OPE them on the defect. Yes. This seems like a consistency condition on conformal defects, but in practice it's proved to be very, very weak 
because there is no positivity. No one says that these coefficients have to be positive. So there is no positivity in this channel. And if you remember in the bootstrap, there was a lot of progress because of positivity. And here there is no positivity because of the one point functions. So people have not been able to make progress to sort of somehow bootstrap the problem. Seems very difficult. Maybe you need two line operators to make it positive, but then maybe you've uh, entered a whole bunch of new complications. Any other questions? It is positive, yes. That's very good, actually, because it's, uh, this expansion should be good near the defect. So higher dimension defect operators are going to be more and more suppressed. Yeah, it's very good that it actually turns negative. So there will be only few singular terms coming from low dimension defect operators. And, and what is the capital I value for the, the last Capital I point? just labels defect operators. <coughs> Wh which one contributes the lowest one? Yeah, the lowest defect operators would be the most important in the expansion. In particular, the unit operator on the defect oh, you need is the most important. It determines the one point functions. What is the one point function that no Guess. Well, it's zero, but it yes. It so when there is no, when the defect is trivial, I mean <coughs> the piece of garbage could be just, there could be no piece of garbage. It's a trivial defect. When the defect is trivial, AI is zero, of course. Right, but physically, why should the system with spins have a no, uh, vanishing one point function? It's because at the, conform at the second order phase transition, there is no scale. So the one point function vanishes if there is no defect. I have 15 more minutes. I just want to uh, make two more remarks about this SL2 symmetry and what it teaches us, and then go to the question of screening, of what screening means. So remark number one, uh, just two more remarks. Remar remark number one is that a kind of important one-point function to write down that appears in the literature is the one-point function of the energy momentum tensor in the presence of, presence of a defect. So it's a small exercise for you. This is my the only exercise for today. Try to <laughs> determine it. It's determined by one coefficient. You can use symmetries, conservation. So using symmetries, I assume rotational invariance. Assume SLD minus 1. Using symmetries and using conservation, Uh, determine the whole correlation, the whole one point function of T mu nu in terms of one coefficient. This coefficient is usually called H in the literature. Determine this uh, one point function. Okay. So you can, s I mean, there are many components, but you can just fix it by symmetries and conservation. This is the first point. <coughs> I'll use that when I discuss entanglement entropy. So it would be a good idea to work it out today if you have time. It's not going to take more than 15, 20 minutes. The second remark is that one special operator on the defect that is completely universal is called the displacement operator. There is a very special operator on the defect that is completely universal. It <coughs> appears in every defect that we will study. It's called, it's called the head of T, namely the displacement displacement operator. So what, why, is this, why such an operator exists? Because there should be some operator on the defect whose physical meaning is to change the shape of the line a little bit. So once you've <coughs> solved the straight, the, gar the piece of garbage that's not moving, you may want to move it a little bit for some short period of time and let it come back. So these deformations of the straight line are described by a very universal operator that's called the displacement operator. And it has scaling dimension 2. It appears universally in every defect con that's conformal. It's a vector, very good, I forgot. An index uh, xi, so that also was i, right? xi, so it's a vector in this direction. You say in which direction you want to deform the line, and you just add the defect operator at that instant in time in which you want to deform that line a little bit. Okay, 
So it's a very universal operator. You can also understand why it appears. So this is the closest thing to somebody asked about uh, phonons. So this is like the analog of a phonon, if you think. It's not something that the line would not change its shape spontaneously. But if you want to change its shape, you have a very universal operator that does this. So you can think about where does this come from. It's because the energy momentum tensor is not going to be conserved in these components because we've broken translational symmetry. So you get a delta function in d minus 1 coordinates times d i. So that's the non-perturbative definition of this displacement operator. It just measures the violation of translational symmetry due to the displacement, due to the line defect. Right? So this has dimension d, this has dimension t plus 1, this has dimension d minus 1, so therefore this has to have dimension 2. That's exactly that exactly works out. So uh, that's why such a universal <coughs> operator exists. Uh, so this is it for SL2R invariant defects for now. Uh, I'm just going to tell you what screening is. <coughs> What do people say that uh, some impurity is screened? When people say that an impurity is screened, what do they mean? So, so you could say that uh, if all the one-point functions vanish, one-point functions won't be able to see the defect. In fact, if all the one-point functions vanish, it means that this channel is trivial. You see, because any Green's function would not see the defect. So Green's functions in the so more precisely, Green's functions in the presence of the defect would be equal to Green's <coughs> functions without the defect. So such a conform so a conformal defect where all the AIs are vanishing. If all the AIs are vanishing for every uh, uh, bulk operator, that means that the Green's functions don't see the defect. So the defect is basically it should be almost trivial. I'll sh uh, you'll see why I'm using the word almost. Uh, it's also equivalent. This is also mathematically equivalent to a vanishing displacement operator. This is a question for you to prove. <coughs> I don't know if it's proven in the literature, but it's kind of obvious. Maybe just devise the argument. If the displacement operator vanishes as a quantum operator, it implies that all the AIs have to vanish. Does anybody see the proof? It vanishes, it consists of some other operator, it's not a fundamental operator. Say again. So it's based on operator. Oh, when I say that the i's vanish, I mean except for the bulk unit operator, of course. Of course, the unit operator in the bulk always have, will always have expectation value 1. So its ai is not vanishing by this definition. So I mean all the non-trivial bulk operators have a zero one point function. That's the same as a vanishing displacement operator, as an operator vanishing. And it's the and this is the same as saying the defect is almost trivial, uh, almost screened. What was the question, though? Does anybody see the proof of why vanishing one-point functions and vanishing displacement operator should be the same? I guess you can use the correlation function including b and then show the operator equation. But how? What's the idea? Like, why would that be true? Uh, because of I mean, you see, once the one-point function is non-vanishing you know where the defect is. Like, the denominator depends on the distance from you to the defect. If you could move the defect uh, not paying any price, which is this, this, this thing, then how would this be non-zero? It wouldn't make any sense. So it's almost because it can have some topological effect or something? Yeah, exactly. So the almost stands for topological. A line operator could have no displacement operator. Could be just You could move it with no price. Uh, it could have no one-point functions, but it would have some braiding or some topological stuff could, ha could be going on. So, so it now it's a little bit a matter of semantics. Uh, it's a little bit matter of semantics, but in this course, just I'm just saying it for the recording to be clear. Um, uh, anything, anything like this, I'll just be called. I'll call that screen. But you should be aware. You should be aware that this terminology is not completely 100% precise because it could be that the line operator has no displacement 
operator, so it's kind of trivial, but it still has non-trivial expectation values when the line, for instance, uh, uh, does this braiding thing. You know, when the line does this, sorry, now it has to be like this. So if, for instance, the line is, now it has to go from above, yeah. So for instance, a line like this, I don't know, could, could have a non-zero, non-trivial expectation value that depends on the number of twists or something like this, even though it has zero displacement operators. So there could be topolo topology in line operators, yeah. but <coughs> I'm going to just call those screen because you cannot see them in experiments where you measure correlation functions or Green's functions. AI is defined like this. Uh, it's when big I is the identity. Yes, yes. No, I think that if all the one point functions of bulk operators vanish, it means that all of those coefficients <coughs> vanish for all capital I. <laughs> well, but I, I, I mean, that, that it's not like they're vanished, they're just trivial. Suppose you have no defect. Well, what is this expansion? It's Taylor's expansion. Then. I'm asking on the other direction. Okay, what's the question? Uh, this is trivial then for the for the for the zero. If and only if. If and only if. The defect is called trivial if and only if all the one point functions vanish except for the unit operator. But the one point function only care about the unit operator. Oh, the defect. Yeah. So if yeah. So if you, you can just imagine a case where the unit operator has only AI. But that's necessary. Uh, let me explain again. Otherwise, the defect is no, no, no. So, what is Otherwise a trivial? Uh, what is a trivial defect? A trivial defect is a, a line that you draw, but there is nothing there. It's the unit operator. So, how does the bulk defect OP look like for such a line? It's the Taylor expansion. A x i of t is the sum of x to the power k d k o. But k runs not from zero. Ah, so k runs from zero to infinity. That it's t it's, this is a trivial defect that you just like. There is nothing there, so the bulk defect OP is just Taylor's expansion. So then the O heads are derivatives of bulk operators, and the delta heads are just k plus delta. So you cannot expect that all the A I capital I vanish. That makes no sense. Yeah, because you can always just move the like move your point of do a table. A trivial defect is the unit operator, that's what it is. So the statement of a bulk defect OP is just this for a trivial defect. It's kind of, so you cannot expect that all those coefficients would vanish. That would make sense. Because that would also mean that bulk prince functions vanish. You can only so that's why I'm demanding that these coefficients vanish. Because they don't appear in those expan in that expansion. Yeah. Only solution to what? I'm saying that if the AI is equal to zero, <coughs> the displacement operator has to be zero. That follows from common sense. And then I call such defects <coughs> trivial. And for such trivial defects, this is the ah. You're asking if from this it follows that this is the bulk OP the bulk defect OP, is that a question? You're asking if those conditions imply this? Or if it, if I see how do you prove one of the Prove which, the, just uh, which one do you want to prove? <coughs> mm. are, are, there, are there almost trivial defects? Yes. For which uh, that general Taylor expansion you work on the right? This one. Yes, does not equal to the thing on the left. Yes. Okay. So this is an, uh, this is the this is the contentful question, and to me it seems obvious that the answer is no. Because if the displacement operator vanishes, this has to be true. There cannot be if the displacement operator vanishes, it means that you cannot possibly know where the defect is. So Taylor's expansion has to be true. So to me it looks at the level of a physics argument obvious that all these implications are correct. But to tell you that somebody likes 
prove it? I don't know. It looks obvious. So I think we're going to have, okay. since we a lot of time for the break, it's a good time to stop. Yes. Yeah. Even though we didn't get to the last. Yeah, it's okay. I'll do it tomorrow. Yeah. Tomorrow, uh, Zora is going to give the first talk tomorrow with a rearranged schedule. Which yeah. isn't yet. Yeah, but at least the first talk will be Zora, who we can now thank. You.